get started, I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. I think I know most of you, but uh, for those that don't, I'm Amanda Manz. I'm the Executive Director of Alumni and Family Engagement, so thank you for coming to our only our second Return and Learn that we've had hybrid since we start, had the pandemic, but our first one of the spring semester, so we're excited. We do have a couple friends that are on Zoom with us, so they're all there too. <laughs> so. Um, we will have our presentation and then we'll also do some Q&A. For those that are on Zoom, if you want to use the chat box, you can submit it there. I'll be monitoring that and be able to get questions over to Dr. Hartshorn as well. So we will go ahead and get started. I'd like to introduce Dr. Kevin Hartshorn. He is our Dean for Student Success as well as the Associate Professor of Mathematics. And as you can see, we're going to be doing some origami. We're going to learn about all kinds of math related to that. So we're super excited to have everybody here. Um, I'm going to talk for a couple minutes just to introduce myself, but for those of you at home, if you want to use this time to do a little prep um, for the hands-on part, if you have origami paper, that would be amazing, but if you don't have origami paper, if you just have some paper that you're willing to fold up, um, just a few sheets of paper, two or three, four or five sheets of paper, um, that would be great. The other thing, as an extra bonus, I don't know how quickly this hour will go, if you have business cards that you are willing to fold up um, for, for the sake of art, um, if you have some business cards on hand. Otherwise, you can kind of see what we're doing, we'll do it. But if you have any notebook, any paper, and any business cards, and I'll give you guys a little bit of time to do it while I share a little bit about what led to all of this. Um, I started teaching here back in 2004, so I've been here for a little while now. Um, when I first started teaching here, I did not do origami immediately then. Um, my origami start story actually starts in graduate school, back in 90, my wife's going to kill me for getting the year wrong, 98. Um, because um, that year, my wife actually had a pretty serious um, accident. It was, it was really bad, she was in ICU for, for a while, um, and she was actually laid up in bed for almost an entire summer. And for that summer, we're graduate students. She was in like this tower studio apartment in somebody's house. There was just rickety stairs going up, so she couldn't use her apartment. One of our graduate student friends put her up in her own, or basically put her up in their living room because they had an elevator. So she was set up in their living room. They created a little privacy partition for her. Um, it was really sweet. It was, re it was really kind. And our circle of friends, um, it was with the church over there, um, gave us a book on origami, just like origami models do. And so she wasn't my wife at the time. At the time, she was my fiance. Um, but the two of us spent the summer just folding models, just filling his apartment with dinosaurs and birds and flowers and just, you know, that was. <coughs> so for me, that was my start of origami. It was, it, was this, it was this way of kind of processing through what we're going through. Um, after I started teaching math here, my area is, uh, I do topology, which is about the shape of space and twisting donuts into coffee mugs and you know rubber sheet geometry, and geometry. Um, those of you who may remember Doris Schatzneider, um, she was a huge influence to me when I came here. My office is filled with a ton of books from her. I have all kinds of syllabi and projects and wonderful things from her. And so, you know, acclimating to Moravia, I took my fancy schmancy research project and really funneled it into geometry and especially geometry connected with art. Um, and then doing the research, I discovered that there was a lot of really interesting mathematical research in origami and connected to origami. I'm like, cool. Uh, so I have fairly regularly taught a 100 level class for non-math majors on math and origami. That's basically project-based. That they build some model and then they learn some of the mathematics behind it. I'm going to show you guys a couple. Um, I did uh, a 200 level course for math majors. So we got a little deeper into the math part because if you get too far into the equations and the coding, you start scaring off certain populations of people. Um, I've also done several research projects. Um, I, my first one was a student who was a double major in chemistry and math, and she did um, on the folding of linkages. So if you think about long molecule chains and how much can they fold before they break. 
Um, and so it's sort of origami of sticks. You know, how, how does that hold up? I had another one, my next one, um, a student did a research project looking at, um, if you want to fold like a, a box or something, and you guys have seen this, like maybe you get the Amazon gift box, um, and you want to kind of cut, cut the paper open so it falls flat. So you can imagine for a cube, it works pretty easily. Like if you, if you kind of cut around here and then cut around here, it kind of folds into sort of this Latin cross shape that would actually fold back up and come to the box. But if you have a more complicated shape, can you just cut it open so it lies down nice and flat? That turns out to be a really hard mathematical question when you get to really complicated shapes. Um, so he did a research project looking at parts of that. And then I, so that's like going from sticks up to paper. So of course, the next project, they went up to another dimension. We talk about paper being folded in three-dimensional space. This student really wanted to know what happens if you have three-dimensional paper that folds into four-dimensional space. The pictures were very confusing. Um, there was a lot of matrices and linear algebra. It was very complicated. Um, and basically, it was a very long paper to show how to do like two folds. It was very complicated. I thought it was cool. So what I'm going to do today is pretty informal. Um, I thought about giving you guys a lot of the research and you know, the deep resources, but I thought instead I'd really try to focus a little bit on some of the things I do, especially in that 100 level class, and maybe hint towards what happens in the deeper areas of your novel. So. This is something I share with my um, 100 level students. And I really like it because um, it speaks to the way I like to think about origami, especially when I'm talking with larger groups who maybe aren't really interested in the math part, but the math part is scary. Um, when you're folding an origami model, the first thing is to be patient. It is so easy to get frustrated with these models. Um, you see something that looks really complicated, and I realize I did not pull all the models out. Um, I don't know, something like a crane, or if you're really fancy, you can do a crane that's like two colored. Um, and I'll just start passing some of these around as they come out. It can get really frustrating, even for what some folks might call a really simple model like that. People are like, oh my god, it, it, it. so be patient, breathe. I have found that that is also the same thing I often tell first year students when they are just adapting to, oh my god, I have all these things to do and I've got like 12 papers and three books to read and I've got to do this and I'm trying to get involved in this club and something's going on. Breathe, be patient, it'll be okay. Um, make folks precise. Um, one of the things I've noticed is people, when people do this is they get a little sloppy. They're like, oh, I'll just fold it over and I'll be fine. It's like, no, 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 it, it, you do, there is a precision that's involved. You need to be careful about where you put those folds. And, um, it, and what you do early on really impacts what happens later. You know, that, that tone that you set at the beginning of the model, that tone you set at the beginning of your educational career, resonates as you go through. So all of you are remembering your college days or some of your students' days and going, yep, make the creases sharp. Um, you know, we'll, we'll fold it over and just be gentle about it, but if you make those creases really precise, or not just precise, but make them sharp, you know, commit to it. Um, sometimes I see the students really struggle with their models, and sometimes I see them struggling with their work, because once you make the choice, commit to the choice. If you have to change later, that's fine. But when, when we decide that we're gonna do it, you know, do it with the gusto that it deserves. Um, look ahead, have y'all seen I'm going to show you in a second. Um, origami instructions, you just see a bunch of pictures, and it all looks very confusing. Um, there's like instructions to read, arrows point here and point up there, and, and you can't quite. Um, sometimes it really helps, rather than try to just figure out what the next step is, is look a couple steps ahead and see where you're going. Because as you see where you're going, then when you come back and look, what you're, you're like, oh, that's what they're trying to do. So sometimes, just keeping your eye a little bit more on the horizon helps you understand what you're trying to do right now. And then relax and enjoy the process. The reason we're doing this is not to um, create pain, is not to create anguish. We're doing this because we enjoy it. Um, and specifically for origami, paper is cheap. 
Um, in fact, today, all the paper is recycled paper. Well, most of the paper is recycled paper. I am a huge fan of recycling efforts, and I will be talking a little bit more about that when I talk about these cubes. So that's my metaphor moment of the day. This is, and usually with my students, I'm very explicit about the metaphor. And I, I'm very clear about drawing bright blue lines by what I mean. So now we're going to fold. Um, so those of you at home, if you have, whether you have origami paper or notebook paper, you can go either way. Here I will pass out origami paper for folks. Yeah, I guess you want to name. <laughs> <laughs> Although I need one. Those um, there's a, a YouTube channel that I watch called, uh, oh, I'm missing, I'm forgetting her name. This is Jennings. This is, and um, she's got a whole series that she does called Story Time. So I just hear her voice go, Story Time. This particular model, um, I use it for a few purposes. This is usually the first model that I do in a class because um, it's a really nice, uh, it's a nice simple model to do and I'm reasonably convinced like it's simple where everybody's going to feel like at the end they can do it. <clears throat> but it's also, um, I find it useful in a lot of ways. Um, when I last did this, um, I was asked to lead the group in sort of a reflective moment one of the things about living in the Zoom world is so many of our meetings these days, we try to start with some kind of a moment of zip. Just take a moment and breathe. And so I had the chance to lead one, and I led everybody in doing this fold while I shared the story I, I told you all about how I started with this. So um, you can see that the first step is just fold the paper in half. If you've got local paper at home, I like to fold it in half, as some of my students say, like a hot dog. If your paper's square, then it's the same either way. So just pull it in half. Does the gray up there indicate the color sign? Um, it does indicate the color. Um, in, for this particular model, it's not really important which way you go. But yes, it does indicate the color. So the first step is to fold it in half. And ah, there you are. Okay, and then the second step is you're going to fold it in half again the other direction. So if, if you're doing the, um, you've got a sheet of paper, so I fold it in half that way, and then I'm going to fold it in half the other way. And like I said, I'm doing nice, precise folds. <laughs> and then you're just going to immediately undo that fold you just did. So you're just back to where you just have it folded in half, but now you have a crease there. Um, now what you're going to do, and I'm going to do it so you can see that the, it's kind of like a bulk fork face towards you. I'm just going to take this side and fold it to the middle. So I'm just going to take this side and fold it to the middle like that. Basically what you're setting up, you're going to do this on the one, it's like you're setting up barn doors. So when, you, when you're done with it, when you get to this stage, that step five, you can see you're basically setting up barn doors. So you shall have something that basically looks like a little barn doors that open and close. Okay. So this is possibly the trickiest step. What you want to do is open those barn doors a little bit. And uh, I'll do it first for you guys and then I'll turn and do it for y'all. Um, where, this, where I have this barn door pointing towards you, we're going to open it up and we're going to take this top crease and just push it down, all the way down. And you can see it just forms this little house looking thing. And then you're going to fold it flat. So where you have the barn door open, you're just going to open up that, spread out that barn door a little bit, just push that top down. That's what lies there. This is the video camera. There we go. Where you have this, this barn door, you're just going to spread it open and just push this part down until it lies right on there. 
And do the same on the other side. I'm just going to pull open that barn door and push this, push this top part down. So it pulls flat. And so when you're done, it should almost look like you've got like a couple little houses. Are you going to do that side too? Other side also? Yep, on both sides. And then if you see you've got kind of a little flap of paper here at the bottom. If you're doing the square one, you have a much bigger flap here. But you have this little flap of paper here on the bottom. Just this little, this little flap of paper. So you want to take that part, and I have to put it down for this. And I'm realizing I was very messy there. And you're going to fold that up. So you can see I folded it up. This, this little flap of paper, I'm going to fold it up right, right along where those houses are. So where, where this, you can see these, these peaks, those triangles have a baseline here. And so I'm just going to fold it over the baseline. Yeah, just fold it right over that baseline. So I'm just going to fold it right over that baseline. Yeah. You're looking right here at step nine, going to step ten. Yeah, that's this. So you can see. Oh, where you have this baseline of the two triangles, you're just folding that middle piece up and mm -hmm. match that baseline. Thank you very much. I think I'm getting there. What's over here? I think we did it right. <laughs> well, that's good. Play the back and mount it. Um, and now that's basically it. So this should just be basically sticking straight out. That part we folded up should be sticking straight out. So this should be sticking straight out. And then just these two right, these two trapezoids on the end, you just fold forward a little bit on the creases that are already there. And you have a little keyboard. That piece you fold it up becomes your keyboard, and you just have a little standing piano. Yep. You just have a nice little standing piano. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's it. Yep. Thank you very much. You got it. Had a help or you got a nice little thing. Thank you myself. Now, for those of you, so if, if, you're good. You got it. You got it. That's exactly it. Yeah. 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 You have to deal with people like that. So if you look something, <laughs> look a little bit like this if you're doing it on a piece of paper. Um, now one thing I really like about this piano, it's, it's a nice piano. It doesn't take a long time to fold. It was a few minutes. It doesn't take a long time to fold. Um, it's pretty doable. Um, you, but again, right, be patient. Be kind to yourself, right? You can see some of those things coming into play. Um, but here's the other thing I like about it is if you take your piano and just knock it over like this, you can use it as a name card. So for those of you that are doing group play, if you're interested, I actually also use this as a, as a name placard. So we'll do an activity, but particularly when I'm doing a math and ironic class, that would be the first model. And then I'll be like, all right, now write your name here, and that's going to be your name card for the class. Like a little icebreaker. Yeah. Very good. But you tell us how, how you got interested in this? What was your, just that little book when you're, when when you your were, was that yeah, book when so, you're, yeah, so I got interested in origami following that book and doing that. Um, once I started doing this um, professionally, like as part of being a professor and doing these classes, I started scouring the internet. I was picking up books, and I'll share a few of these books with you in a minute. Um, just looking for all kinds of models and inspirations and ideas. Um, and so if you dig around enough, there's all kinds of really cool things you can find. There's a few things I've designed over time. I don't remember if I managed to bring any of those. But we'll see. How am I doing on time, Leslie? 7.21. Thank you.
All right, I'll talk about this one and I'll let you guys play with this. Um, but I think I'm gonna I'm gonna gloss past this because I actually want to get to some of my toys and share them. With you. Um, this turned up point. Um, um, Kazuo Haga um, is a biologist who, on his commute on the bus, needed something to do. And so what he would do is grab random scraps of paper and start asking questions, just playing with it. Not hard questions, not complicated questions, just questions. So one of the questions he asked, just playing with a nice blank piece of paper, is if I pick a point somewhere on this piece of paper, and I, well, let's, sorry, let me be a little more formal about it. So I'm gonna hold this corner tight, this corner ain't going anywhere. If I take this corner and fold it down somewhere on the piece of paper, let's say here, fold it over. You can see a little brown triangle appears, right? If I fold it over, a little brown triangle appears. All right, that's fine. But if I take this point and fold it down here, I fold the point down here, notice I get a quadrilateral instead. Right? So if I fold the point, if I take the point and fold it down here, I get a quadrilateral. So we could map on this every point on this piece of paper. If I fold this corner down to each point, when do I get a triangle and when do I get a quadrilateral? And that's what he wondered. Which points, which points on the paper can you fold to to give you a quadrilateral? Which points on the paper give you quadrilateral? Uh, which points give you a quadrilateral? Which points give you a triangle? And that, that, that's what he would do on the bus. And so he, it was like a cool little geometry puzzle. Um, when I was planning this, my original thought was to make you guys do this. Um, I think I will not, I think, would you guys like to see the answer? Like Would you guys like to see the answer? Yes. 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 <laughs> from you, the answer, the answer is actually kind of cool. From you, we would. That is actually the answer. Is it turns out if you take the sorry, he, he did it from this corner, this the corner A, that little A you see on the bottom right. If you fold this point A anywhere inside of this I, you're always going to get triangles. And if you fold it outside the eye, you get quadrilaterals. Hmm. And so he was just playing with this, and he discovered this really pretty design that pops out of the paper. And so he has a whole family of puzzles that he did like this. Um, just with this puzzle, with the turned up point, you get slightly different pictures if you use different paper. If your paper is a rectangle, it's not going to look quite like this, but you're going to see these cool circular arcs show up. Um, and then in my math class, we'll be like, well, why are you getting a circular arc? How does a circle come over folding papers in half? It turns out the reason is if you think about when you fold a piece of paper over, I'm at a triangle now, and down here, say, for example, I'm a quadrilateral, the transition point happens when you pivot on one of the other corners. There's like a pivot that happens. And so it's really when that point that you're folding over is kind of being pulled along by the pivot from the other corner. And that's why there's two circular arcs, because it's when the two corners are the pivot for the point you're folding over. So these kinds of puzzles are fun because they're not hard to think about. It's just you're, you're playing with paper and you start experimenting stuff. And as you start doing it, you're like, wait, something kind of cool is happening. I'm seeing an, a neat image appear. And then as you see the image appear, you're like, oh, this is actually a lesson. We've got something to learn here. And it's telling us something about the geometry of the paper and, and what's happening. These are the kinds of things that actually kind of get me a little excited because they're, they're not big, deep, hard, complicated research things, but they're really illuminating something a little bit about the simple world we're living in. So now I do want to share some of the stuff that I've got. And I realized I did not pull all this stuff out when I started. There are roughly three general styles of origami I like to think about. Look at that. It's amazing. 
So the first style is what most people are familiar with. It's sort of the traditional origami. This is the origami that you take a single sheet of paper and you make something really cool out of it. So for example, and can you guys on the screen see my iPad is now flying around? It should be, okay. Um, there we go. There's a little mouse. Mm -hmm. Just a single sheet of paper. And you can see it's actually designed so that the tail is white and the rest of it's brown. And then I'll pass these around. Um, did I bring an actual traditional there? Um, there's a really cool, you could do a mask. This is like a tiger mask. You can see a little mouth there on the bottom. And then you can see some eyes. Uh, in addition to the traditional crane, you can get much more complicated with your cranes. You can do things like making a tail much faster. So you could have a little crane with a fancy tail. Um, this is also a single sheet of paper. You can have two cranes that are bound together. So two cranes that are sort of matched together. They're just flying, joined up along one wing. And did I have one more to share? Oh, yeah. yeah. And one more I'm going to share, and I'm going to share this one a little differently. I should have screen um, So, yeah, one more I'm going to share. This one is um, an action item. Um, it's actually connected to the next category I'm going to talk about, so I'm not going to pass it around just here. So this one is just, it looks just like a little folded up thing. But if I grab the two corners, it pulls apart and it comes back together. Wow. That's cool. So you can see, so this one, like, it stretched really tight and it opens up and it pulls back together. So when you're playing with these kinds of traditional models, so these single sheet origami, there's obviously the big question of what can be created. Uh, for years, it was very traditional. It was you know, passed on from parent to child. It was passed on from artist to uh, student. Um, but but the, the models evolved slowly. There were certain base things. Like there was a certain shape. Like everybody knew you could, this is what's called a bird base because it's got like two little legs here and two little wing flaps up here. It's got like two little leg things here and two little wing flaps up here. And then once you knew how to create this, you could do all kinds of art in sort of manipulating this and making it into whatever actual bird you wanted. But it was slow. Um, and it was slow, it was a slowly evolving process. Uh, around the 80s, um, mathematicians, computer scientists, engineers, uh, people who had like computing thoughts started really getting deep with trying to do very, very complicated models. It went from creating sort of that list of instructions like you saw for the piano, where you're like, here's a step, here's a step, here's a step, to giving you crease patterns. So that crease pattern is what would happen if you literally took one of the models, um, if you took, say, this mouse, and you actually Unfolded it. And then you look at the creases that you want. And you can actually analyze these creases and actually see the different parts. Um, what you see here on the screen is actually the crease pattern of a crane. Um, on the top right of the screen, you can see the little zigzag pattern, that's the beak. And then you can see it coming down and that's the neck, the next little zigzag. On the bottom left, that whole, that little bunch of stripes on the bottom left, it goes up in the zigzag pattern is the tail. 
And then you can see the big triangle on the bottom right and the big triangle on the top left are the two wings. Yeah. So, and so people learned how you could actually generate what you wanted using this crease pattern. Because now they, you know, we have learned how to take those, those elements. And so if I want to do a spider with eight legs, well, I just have to plot out how to do those eight eight of these little designs that are going to be kind of sticking out and then just how you plot that on the paper and then fill it in. And then you get a nice 3D printer to actually print out the pattern and do the creases for you because that's going to be really hard and then you spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to fold it into shape. <coughs> and so this idea of origami design and is what you can see and you can see groups from MIT, from Berkeley, from you know all over where they have these huge competitions where they make these hugely ornate, complicated things. And it's often starting from thinking about the crease pattern and what we know about how the crease pattern translates to the shape. But it's, I feel a little bit like when you see on those old maps, here be dragons. It's like I'm going more into detail, but I, it gets, the, the, the rabbit hole gets very deep very quick. Um, so that's a lot of the traditional origami. I love tiling origami. Those are amazing. Yeah. Those are amazing. Um, I want to go back to this one. This little guy is really, if I open it up, an example of a tessellation. Because you can actually see there's a square pattern in the paper. If I hold this up on the camera, there's a square pattern there on the paper. And it's just how we created the folds and creases, the mountains and valleys, which way the creases go. That has, now, for my purposes, this is just a fun game to play. This is kind of nice. Um, I try to be careful how much I pull it. If you really pull it, it, it might break. But, um, but if you want to play with it. But it has some interesting it has some interesting applications. And I have another one that's similar. One application, and this is one that's very similar. Um, some of us are old enough. I don't know if you all are old enough. Um, to go on road trips with maps. <laughs> when my wife and I first started going on road trips, we would have our car packed with maps. Like physical, AAA, you get a whole stack of maps. Trip triptych. Trip yeah. Well, the triptychs are nice because they're like a little older. I'm talking like, you know, and so my wife's in the passenger seat trying to unfold the whole map, and then you got to fold it again. It's like, I don't care. Just crunch it together, right? It, Maps can be a real pain to fold and unfold because you forget which way it's supposed to fold or what order. And, um, Miura is credited for thinking about a different way of folding maps. Is that if you set up the crease pattern right, then if you have your if you have your map in your glove box and you pull it out and you want to open it, then you just open it. And then when you're done with the map, you just fold it. And the reason is, instead of being squares, like we usually think of maps or rectangles, notice that they're like little diamond shapes. So notice the crease patterns are little diamond shapes. And so when you set up the diamond shapes, and then you set up the creases in just the right way, now it's a little bit of a pain the first time to fold it. But then once you have it in shape, you can see that the paper is just ready to fold right back up. And so I have it open. And then when I'm done reading it, I don't break it pulls right back up and it'll fit nice in the glove box and there will be very little swearing in the car. <laughs> <laughs> so and so it's a, it's a neat, it's a really neat application to something nobody uses anymore. Um, except it's also very useful when you need to pack a very large thing into a small container and have it confidently open later. For example, if you need to put a solar sail up into space, you want to be able to press the solar sail into a rocket, send the rocket into space, and nobody is up there to unfold it. And so this, this same idea that was used to make that little flapper thing is roughly the same idea as, as what has been used for deploying solar sails into rockets. Is you find something that basically you have two motors that can just pull it in, and then all the creases will just make it collapse into what will fit into the rocket. And then when it plot, and then when it gets into where it needs to be, it deploys by just pulling at the relevant places. 
And so that's where these ideas of origami go from like a fun little toy to, oh, wow, that might have an application to, oh, NASA is actually actively interested in this. Um, the tilings are also really interesting because you can do tons of fun stuff with it. This is a single piece of paper, no glue, <coughs> no tape, no anything. It's called a magic carpet. Um, and you can see it kind of compresses a little bit. It you know, compresses and expands. It's also fairly firm. Like, I can use this as a coaster. I'm not going to because I don't want to get wet. Um, but you could use this as a coaster. Um, I'm going to pass this around when it comes back. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it. You can create tilings with different shapes. One thing I like about when you do the tilings with these shapes, I put this up here. This is just a tiling by polygons. What you guys see on the screen is the tiling by polygons. But you can use those <coughs> as inspiration. So for example, this tiling with squares is basically inspired by one of these polygon tilings. Um, they're also nice because the flip side tends to also be very cool. And so you can see both sides of this. It reminds you of an air filter. A little bit. And that's that's exactly right. Um, I was not going to go with an air filter. I was actually going to think about medical technology. Mm -hmm. If you make it much, much smaller, um, being able to help provide help. Uh, I am not a medical person. I'm not <laughs> Um, to help open um, larger veins or arteries. Because if you take that and think about rolling the front and back together so it forms like a little loop, then that's something that can actually compress so that it can be injected in and then expand when it's in place. Um, the screen one that I'm passing around is another variation of that. So yeah, that's exactly right. You're, you're, you're seeing like air filters, you're seeing a lot of these different designed objects that we see in the world. Have some of these organic And I'll just one more And you made all these yourself? I personally made everything I have shared so far. It's amazing. Uh, you're you're, you're nice. very patient. You're very precise. <laughs> you got to relax. Uh, I've been doing this for a little while. This isn't your first yes. rodeo. Mm -hmm. I have a towel. Incredible. It's fantastic. Um, so the last area. So, so kind of, I, tessellations is one of my favorite. Um, I kind of regret there were two big tessellations um, carpet tilings I wasn't able to bring with me because one of them is actually art in my office, and the other one I think I left at home. Um, these are the ones that I've had the most luck in designing my. Most of these things I've made at somebody else's design, I just pulled them. Um, there's some of these tessellations where I was like, oh, I made that. Okay, I did that. I'm very proud of that. That was amazing. That was, um, like that was like a span of a bridge or something. You know? Yeah, and this is another one. Um, the curve that this forms um, is part of what's called a hyperbola. It's an approximation of a hyperbola. Um, but if I expand it, I want to be careful how much I expand it. This has actually been through a number of presentations. Um, the creases basically are a square pattern. In fact, the creases are literally just a square pattern. They're just concentric squares. They're just the concentric octopus. squares. The but the way that the diagonals, the way you, you choose the diagonals and then you do the creases, it naturally wants to form into this very cool, except for uh, hyperbolic pattern. It's like the Sydney Opera House or the Oculus in New York by the 9-11. Uh, my favorite kind okay. for reasons. Um, so you can see here in the picture, I did not pull this thing in the picture. This is a, a Wikipedia picture. This, this, the, the one you see on Zoom right now is not me. Um, but I'm showing it because it shows you both the very complicated bird and right there below the bird, you can see just that little triangle that was pulled. That little triangle is very easy to pull. Um, however, if you look at that bird, you gotta pull a lot of them. 
And so one of the things I love about modular origami is um, as a faculty member who's been here for a number of years, um, I spend a lot of time in faculty meetings. And they are very riveting, don't, take, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but sometimes it helps to have something to occupy I think I know where he's going. <laughs> and so I, it has been remarked to me that people have observed that I spend faculty meetings just holding stuff. And one of it is I will hold all the pieces for design and then see if I can get it assembled and put together. Um, one of the places where you see I do this design a lot is with polyhedra. Um, and I really like these because, like I said, the pieces themselves are not very complicated. You just pull them right out. It's just a little piece of paper you fold into a diamond. And so this piece itself is not a terribly complicated thing to fold. Uh, I, the, when I do this project, this is not the hard part. I mean, the first one, you got to learn how to do it. Um, the challenge is to fold this, you need to make 30 of these, three zero. And so let's stick them together. And, and that is a matter of just you know, figuring out how they fit together. It's amazing. And as you guys can see, I have done this a couple times, hence my confidence in, you know, just ripping the parts of the paper. So it comes together. I'm going to share two of them, and the reason is these are both the same model. You can actually see they both basically look the same. Um, they both use that same like parallelogram looking piece of paper. Um, but one of them you'll see has some extra weird little crease patterns going on, where the other one seems much more plain. Because once you figure out how the modular part, how they fit together, then you can go back and how do I play with the individual, those little individual pieces, these smaller pieces. And how can I vary that so that when I do the same assembly, I get something that looks a little bit different? And I'm going to give you guys two examples of it. First is these two. So you can see some of the variation. And then I've got a bowl. Because um, I got very excited about the fact that you could do the same thing over and over again and make it look different just by choosing a slightly different way of doing the module. And so I started doing it a lot. And so those of you on the screen, you can see in my bowl, I've got several different versions of the same model. And so you guys are welcome to take a look at it. These each require 12 pieces of paper. And so once I figure out how I'm going to fold it, I just do it 12 times. But I'm pretty sure all of the figures in there, you just have, you'll see different patterns, just because I changed with that individual building block how that individual building, but the assembly process is the same. It's like artwork when you look at it. It's beautiful. Now when you think about when they used to say the Moravian star, that was like done in a math class back in Germany. Is that called a acosahedron or whatever they call that shape or um, a rumba, it, it, was, it was a rumba acosahedron. Okay. Now yeah. That, that could be made from paper? Is that what those kids were doing, making it from paper back then? Uh, yes, they were making it from paper. Um, you can still get the kits for those from the Moravian Archive. Right. Um, and I've got one in my office. Um, that, that was literally a math lesson. Um, what I find fascinating about that being a math lesson is that was a math lesson for, I want to say like eighth graders, maybe younger, maybe younger, like for kids. It was a math lesson for kids. And when you look at the math lesson now, and you kind of parse, I mean, it's in German, but, but German aside, when you look at the math now, you're like, that's at least a high school math. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first year we had Heritage Day, um, I bravely, and in retrospect, somewhat foolishly, said, I'm going to teach everybody in the room how to fold a star. Um, that first Heritage Day, I think, was our smallest one. We only had 1,200 people at the <coughs> event. It's was huge. Um, so I got to teach a class of 1,200 people how to fold a star. It was a little intimidating. I think that the history lesson about the Moravian star went over a little bit better than the folding experience itself. I learned a lot from that. <coughs> um, yeah, but the, the Moravian star is definitely part of that. I do like kind of the origami people for that as well. And Kevin, if you remember when we were younger, elementary school we used to make snowflakes and you could use the scissors to make the patterns and that was that was like a fun day 
I didn't even talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole other area of origami called kirigami which is when you not just fold paper, but you can cut the paper. Right. And there's a whole nother layer of artwork, and a lot of it is very much like the snowflake design, where you can create really cool objects just by careful ways of where you cut. Amazing. Are there questions I should be answering from that? There was just one about making writing stars. So. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the last thing I'm going to talk about, and I don't know how much time we'll have to get into it, um, I've got these cubes. So, um, at one point, I learned that business card origami was a thing. Um, and I learned about these like big projects you could do with business cards um, in origami. Or you could use with business cards to build things. And um, I was like, that's kind of cool. And they're not hard. And once you learn how to build the basic building block, um, and this one's covered up, so let me take the cards off. Well, this is uh, they're just business cards. They're, they're literally just business cards. Amazing. They're just business cards. But the, the block has these little flaps on it. So the block has these little flaps on it. <coughs> if, you have two, <coughs> if you have two blocks, then the two flaps on the one and the two flaps on the other turn this 90 degrees, will interlock with each other and they'll hold on tight. So that has no glue, no tape. That's just the blocks locked together. It's so cool. Um, and I was like, this is great. Where do I get business cards from? <laughs> and so I, I, I asked the people who do some of these projects, I said, well, what you do is you go to your local print store and ask for rejects. I was like, oh, okay. So I went to a couple print shops and asked for rejects. Um, and I got boxes. And I started building a bunch of things. Um, here's one. But I, I don't know whose business cards those are, because some, some printing company said, oh, here's some rejects. But then I realized I knew a great printing company that had rejects. Um, <laughs> so I, what happened was, one year, I really wanted to do one of these huge projects that was going to require like 3,000 cards. Um, so I sent an all-campus email saying, if you have business cards you don't need anymore, send them my way. Because if you get a promotion, you need new business cards. Your job title changes, you need new business cards. I'm quitting, I'm moving on to another institution. You know, so So I got tons of business cards. Um, and so I was, I was just, you know, and so I would just get in campus mail just a stack of business cards or a block of business cards. And it was like, great. Um, then Moravian briefly went through a campaign where we were toying with the live, learn, enjoy um, motto, slogan. Yeah. Um, it didn't last very long, and then we moved on to something else. And marketing said, Kevin, we have a bunch of blank business cards that we're not going to use. Do you want them? <laughs> the boxes were about this big, and I got like seven boxes. Tons of boxes. <laughs> I'm still working my way through them slowly. Um, this is a different business card again from the Live, Learn, Enjoy. Um, I've started to have opinions about the business cards we select based on how they fold into cards. I did not like these cards because see how um, it's not very symmetric. So when I fold it over, I'm like, it doesn't look as nice. I don't like it. We changed to university. I'm like, oh, we're in college cards. Give me all the college I will tell you that the new Moravian University cards, I am very much a fan of. Yeah, they look nice. Yeah, These are the new Moravian University cards. Nice. Those are nice. I really, now, I don't have a big supply of free ones. These are literally the ones that I was issued when we changed over, so I can't just go use them when I'm really to you. Um, I still have to work. <laughs> it was like, well, um, I'm still working my way through these. Um, but I love it because it does become this way of sort of reusing, you know, that these were things that people are basically going to throw away. You have no use for that. Um, but we do have use for them. They're, they're very nice. Um, so we've got about 10 minutes. I can stop talking and just answer questions, or I can show you guys how to fold one. Not one of these. Yeah, very good. Fascinating. Yeah, show us. I'll see you in that. So, Reagan College. Live, learn, enjoy. We're not ready in college. 
I mean, we still live with joy. That's just not our slogan. Uh, <laughs> so I'm just going to hand out some cards to everybody. Stack. Everybody probably wants at least six. Mm. And so, so those of you at home, if you have business cards, if you're willing to sacrifice six of your cards. <laughs> um, what else can you use besides business cards? It's probably would work with cards cards. Mm -hmm. Like if you have a deck of playing cards. Okay. About five or six years ago, did you happen to see the display at the um, Allentown Art Museum? The, the big origami show that was there for a month. Oh yeah, I heard about that. I don't remember if I made it there. Oh, it was um, amazing. You loved it. Um, one of my colleagues over at um, Lafayette, Ethan Burkhoff, um, hosted a really cool origami show over at Lafayette, and that included a huge barn raising project. Um, and I mean, the thing stood about this tall, and it was a business card project. Uh, it was a it was a sliced cube, so it was a it was a was called a Mender sponge, but it was kind of sliced in half down the side. It was a beautiful project. It was very cool. Um, Ethan, um, I don't know why, um, Ethan, Professor Burkhoff over in Lafayette, he was one of the people, when I first came to break and I said I started learning that this was like a real site that people could study, he was one of the guys that I worked with. I was like, oh wow, this is a research project. Alright, so if you want to pull these yourself, just take two business cards um, and put them face to face. But forming, but at right angles to each other. So they form a nice T. Or a nice plus. So really a plus. As much, as much as possible, you really want them to be perpendicular and you really want them to be centered on each other. So you're going to form a nice plus. And as much as possible, you want them perpendicular to each other and centered on each other. And give it, make sure you get a nice firm grasp on it where they're perpendicular to each other and centered on each other. And then this, see how the two flaps kind of hang over the side because you're not stacking them up correctly? Um, fold those over. I wish I had a ruler. <laughs> um, sometimes when I, these particular cards, you will find I also don't like because they don't fold nice. Yeah. When you fold them, they, yeah. I, I've grown to have weird opinions about business it's cards. It's on an angle. Oh, you're right, yeah. Yeah, it's on an angle. They crack. Yeah, yeah, they crack and they're on an angle. <laughs> I want to keep folding it so it's perfect. <laughs> I, I, I try to be very careful not to express to marketing my opinions because they bear absolutely no bearing on the reality of what business cards need to do. Um, but I don't like these cards because they crap when you fold them. Is there a difference between glossy cards and non-glossy to finish um, The numeration <laughs> ones are glossy and when you fold over, they fold over really, really nice. Yeah. So these numeration cards are just oh, yeah. excellent. They're glossy and these are that's very That's a difference. That's a difference. This is a college card, not the university card. Okay, and, and do that with both cards. So they both kind of, so now they should be basically holding on to each other. So fold the bottom up and two. Uh, fold it, yeah, fold that over the other card. Yeah. Fold, fold the excess part, fold the excess part over the other card, and same with the other one. It's just they're going to fold in opposite directions. So when you're done, they try to fold on to each other. And then you can pull apart. Like fold over the flaps? Yep. So it kind of covers the other yep. piece. And then you just pull them apart, you've got two. Oh, look. Uh, once you have these two, put them down and do it two more times. Okay. There you go. There you go. I'll have to watch it again. I'll have to watch it again. You fold, you Put them into a plus, make it nice and perpendicular, nice and centered. Nice and perpendicular, nice and centered. I don't know we have to work tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're just going to fold the two sides over the partner and fold the two sides over the partner. This is so cool. It's amazing how it is. Take them apart. Put them down. Is there another question? They have four little steps. Yeah, right. Take them apart. Oh, yeah. this is because I'm. I didn't. He's got them apart yeah. right there. He's got them apart on the. And then, what's it? Take them apart, right? Yep. Yeah. Then, yeah. Yep. And then take them apart and do it one more time because you want six of them total. You want to put them into a nice plus shape. 
nice and perpendicular to each other. You want to fold the two sides over and do the same so the cards are hugging each other. So this is the part that requires, this is where some assembly is required. Okay. Um, so this is the part that once you get how it works, it works really well, but I have found, I have not found a good way to articulate this quickly. So I'm gonna see how to do it. So here's the idea. Um, these little flaps that are on the side are what's holding everything together. You want the, these little, this little flat part to be on the outside. And you can see that here, right? The flap's on the outside. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if I have to be the same color, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Right. It, it'll make an aesthetic difference, but it doesn't matter. So if I have one card, um, what I want, so this middle part is like the face of the cube. So I want the flap of the other card to hold this in. So I'm going to have the two cards. And I'm going to hold, hold them both so the flaps are pointing towards you. Um, take one of the cards and turn it 90 degrees. Let me, let me try, like I said, particularly the first time it's hard. So I'm going to take this card, and this card's going to be the bottom of my cube. This card is going to be one of the sides. So I want this flap to come under the bottom come under that cube. So, oh, I drop the right. so you can see that flap is kind of going to be holding on the outside. It's going to be just like that. It's going to be just like that. Okay, so if you can figure this first one out, then the rest is just getting the puzzle. Yep. Now do I put it? Yeah. Uh, okay. Do I do like this? Yep, like that. Okay. That okay. Ooh, you're 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 doing good. You're way ahead of here. The oh. teacher. Yep. Because now, so each of you have six pieces. Cube has six sides, and so each piece is going to do that. And so you just want to set them up so this the little flap is always on the outside. And so you can see when this piece comes in, you can see I, I put it here so this this flap here on the bottom. But I also need this flap to be on the outside. So now it's a puzzle. I, I've done this a lot, so I can get the credit do it with my hand, but you're, sometimes it helps to have two hands. So you can see when I put this in, I'm putting it there, but I also need that to be on the outside. Well, how do you hold it together? Yeah, if I have one on the outside. There's a trick here that I have. Yeah, a little bit of a trick here. I'm going to get the third one. Where's the scotch tape? Oh, there it is. There Where's is the scotch tape? Like, do I do this one like underneath yep. like that? That's exactly right. right? And That's then you can see the next one will go this way because you can see the two flaps will go on the outside. Uh, and then it yeah, yeah, yeah. under that. Yeah, okay. All right. Yep. So shot. Yeah, so what's gonna what happen is at home. when you're doing like the trying to put the fourth and fifth card on there, you're gonna be like, this is not holding together. <laughs> try this at home. Right. Well you do try this at home. <laughs> I'll try it all before you go to bed. Adult supervision. So, and but that last one, um, you can see I've got kind of two flaps here waiting for it, and then so I'm going to take this last one. It's going to fit right here over the top, but I got to get it under those flaps. And once you get that last one in, it will actually hold together pretty well. You gotta be patient. Though. You gotta fold to be patient. This is the this is the patient. Part. Oh, this is the part I don't like. I got these, but what am I doing wrong over here? This one went in. Yeah. I have to pull this one. Oh shoot! You're fine. Right. Uh, make sure that that flaps on that side. That flaps on that side. Yeah. And then that flaps on that side. And then we'll flap here on the side. All right. So it's all about one try. And I think that you're left hand. Yeah. Yeah. So you yeah. got a flap over here. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, 
not a kind of. Oh, it's, it's like making a box, like doing a I box. I think the key word when you're teaching it kind of make sure you're very clear that the flaps are always on the outside. That's so exactly you, right. That's you right. You said it, but you sort of like slid through it. You, you, it you didn't, it, 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 like you didn't say it in like giant letters. The flaps no. definitely have the key or the flaps have to be on the outside. That is definitely the key. You say it. I know what English that meant. Flaps on the outside. And it, and it really is the key. Those, those flaps being on the outside is what makes all of this work right. So, I go one more the other. so does the concept work for other shapes or only squares? Right, I got one left here. So in. Um, I have done something similar for octahedra. Mm -hmm. um, the way I fold it is a little different. The assembly process is a little different. Um, these are ones that I like to do just when I'm idly talking with somebody. I'm like, give me a couple of your business cards. This requires I think more. There's other ways to do it, but the cubes are really, they're kind of fundamental in a couple ways. One, once you build a cube, you can fit them together in all kinds of ways, right? So where's the tape I can? Where's this, where's the Yeah, well, I, I just want to show you guys how this ends. These flaps being on the outside, not only is it key to make these hold together, it's also key to how they hold each other together. So you can see there's flaps on the outside here, and there's flaps on the outside here. If I have them 90 degrees from each other, the flaps will actually interlock together. So, so the other block holds the other one in place. Yeah, and so the two true. blocks actually will literally hold each other together. Ah, so they're, they're not meant to be held like this right now. To the other. And so now these two blocks are very firmly held together. Oh. And so, so when you say that the flat being on the outside is important, that is literally the big key. That is exactly right. But that's what generates these kinds of objects. I will stop there because I think I'm now five minutes over time. Kevin, this is fantastic. Seriously. A couple thank yous in the chat. And Janet Matz was telling us how she made 100 Moravian stars for during COVID for her Christmas. Oh, wow. Oh, that's wonderful. This one's on the outside. This is great. Did you get your No. It's just the point on the drive. Sorry, but you have to do two of them to get them together. You need two of them. That's like a that's like cool variation. There's a thousand cranes project, but I like the hundred Moravian stars project. That's very cool. It's like when I went to, took an art lesson when I was younger. I leave my stuff behind, and when I come back the next lesson, <laughs> the art teacher really made it look a lot nicer than when I did. So I'm going to leave this behind here, Kevin. So when I come back, I'm going to look at my cues. Thank you all. That was Thank you very much for taking your time out to show us. My pleasure. It's, a, it's a definitely a very nice diversion. I have a question. Yes. What does the Dean of Student Success do? Uh -huh. uh, so my, my job actually started when we started the Vision 2020 Strategic Plan back in 2015. Um, the idea of instituting my role was to really think about how we modernize and put a focus on how we um, support, retain our students, and help our students achieve success, um, including think, of, think about how we help students define success. So uh, a lot of my work initially was working with offices like the registrar, student accounts, financial aid, student life, um, working with faculty on how do we help ease some of the barriers where students kind of stuck with. Um, students who don't get registered, you know, it's like, let's get you registered. Students who are trying to figure out how to pay their bills. Students who need to figure out how to pay for their textbooks. Like, how do we help ease some of those barriers? Um, my job evolved, and so I ended up taking up leadership of the advising program, um, our academic support program. So we um, have really been updating how we do our tutoring and peer support. We've really been targeting our resources at courses, particularly first year courses where we know that they are barriers, either barriers in the sense that students who do poorly in those courses don't retain, or students who do poorly in those courses aren't going to be able to progress. Um, courses like calculus, economics, intro Spanish, intro French, right, the kind of the, the barrier, let, let's channel some of our academic support funding and efforts there. Very good. 
Um, I oversee the Accessibility Services Center, and we've really been updating. Um, you guys are all alums. You probably, for you guys, was probably the Learning Center or the Academic and Accessibility Center. One of the things I did is I actually separated um, academic support from accessibility services because one of the things I really wanted to do was really promote a destigmatization. Destigmas. I wanted to destigmify um, our notion of disability, our notion of accessibility. I didn't want um, the need for accommodations to be conflated with the need for academic support. It, I didn't want to um, suggest that people with disabilities, people who needed accommodations, were somehow academic DE students. Um, and so we separated out, which I'm very happy about. Um, Michelle Cuck, who works in the Accessibility Services now, is wonderful. She um, now does a coaching program particularly for students um, as you're transitioning from high school using an IEP, 504, whatever, to college where you're working with accommodations, that transition is sometimes hard for students. So she created a coaching program. So in addition to just getting you your ADA required accommodations, she provides coaching services to help students learn how to build on their strengths, um, you know, and, and do, you know, be successful here, um, given, given the strengths and assets that they bring with them. Um, we also, uh, those of you who recall Carol Reese, who used to be our VP of Advancement, one of the things that she left right before she retired um, was the creation of an Office of Veteran Military Affairs. Uh, and so I am lucky enough to be able to also oversee Marilyn Kelly Cavada, who is our Director of Veteran and Military Services. Um, she's been doing an amazing job helping students coming who are veterans, who are dependents of veterans, spouses of veterans, um, feel supported. She's also really been working hard with Lehigh and the Steel Battalion in supporting our ROTC students. So my area of student success is kind of all the things in academics to how do we help the students progress through. And these are the various offices that I've been lucky enough to meet. A lot of things you said weren't even here when I was here. So <laughs> <laughs> they already come along, but yeah. the fact that you're working on that. So, I mean, we didn't talk about things like uh, someone with a learning disability or anything. It was all just, you know, you didn't just sort of ignored it because you didn't want to make anybody feel bad. Right. Right? Yeah, and, and when you're looking at, um, I mean, there's a broad range of disabilities we can, talk, we, we can be talking about, and a lot of them are very invisible mm -hmm. disabilities. Um, and some of it, one of the things I love about our all back initiative, I, I get a whole other hour on this, so you guys got to stop me at some point. One of the things I love about our All Mac initiative is how it has evolved um, the way we think about accommodations. Things that used to require accommodations are now so much easier. Um, note takers, you know, so the students with certain kinds of um, disabilities need a note taker, and so traditionally we would have to hire some student in the class who want to take the notes, upload it. Sometimes we still have to do this. But now that all the undergraduate students are issued iPads, we make sure that the iPad has Notability or some similar app on it, which will record the lecture, and the student can take what notes they can because we really want them to practice, right? Because we really want to help them be able to navigate to the next, but it will record the lecture for them. And it'll provide the same note service that they have. Um, through COVID, we learned through Zoom that all of this can be recorded. And so, you know, challenges about recording lectures or how do I do it if I can't keep up or we can just record the lecture. Um, the Mac laptop, well, and the iPad, does um, all kinds of screen reading features, um, text to voice, voice to text, which, so things, uh, so things that used to be like, how are we gonna help accommodate this student? They're like, oh, well, they've got the laptop, so they're good. We just have to train them on how to use this piece. Um, and so it, what I like about the conversation we're having about accessibility is we're shifting from this idea of how do we help this student to how do we set up the environment so that it's welcome to all of our students. Uh, the buzzword we're using is universal design. Um, how do we structure the classes? How do we structure the environment? How do we structure the campus? So it's not like how do we account accommodate this student as if there's something wrong with that student. Instead, how are we setting it up so we're being welcome to everybody? Fantastic. Like I said, I, I can go on. I just I sometimes. Yeah. You cover a lot of ground. Really do. We have to play for Katie's game and had the ROTC come out there in the oh, yeah, yeah. basketball game. I think most of them from Moravian, but I think they had one from either Lehigh or Lafayette. Yep. That was there. Yeah, Marilyn showed me some of the pictures from that. That was fantastic. Great. 
just yeah. to be there. Everyone was very excited. Well, everything that people did here, it's, it's, you know, all the things you say are good, because I remember when I was in school, people needed extra time to do a test, they couldn't see, mm -hmm. they needed someone to help them see, or even hearing. Yep. And the user maybe need a little bit more time to do things, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah, it, it's, it's, that's one of the areas that I've been, I've been really excited about some of the changes we made. Um, we had a lot of students coming in recently with um, various hearing impairments. Mm -hmm. And um, Otter is like our go-to app for a lot of that uh, because of the dictation it provides is amazing. Uh, it integrates really nicely with Zoom, so you can kind of actually realize that you didn't do that here. Um, uh, it's something that a student can have on their phone, but also the professor can have, so it's up there at the class, and so there's, it provides a lot more freedom to be able to do things and have events and have, like I said, more people just be able to do it. So, it's good to hear. <laughs> I might have been hanging out with Michelle a lot today, so I got <laughs> really good. Well, thank you everybody for joining us, those on Zoom, thank you as well. And our next Return and Learn will be March 31st with Dr. Jane Berger, and she's going to be talking about a book that she has recently published. So the registration is out for that, so you can register. We'll do that hybrid as well, so we'll be over at the Alumni House in person and then on Zoom for anybody who wants to join us that way. Did you say 31st? 31st, yep. What, what month? March. Yep. Oh, she's wonderful. And she is finishing her stint as um, Dean of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion. Yep. Um, and so she, I'm sure, would love to talk about some of the things that we've been doing recently to support Mercy Equity on campus. Well, thank you all for joining thank us tonight.